Thank you. <laughs>
oh, 20 years. Uh, we're there for fellowship and prayer and uh, potluck. But now it's bring your own table. Uh, this Wilson in the Park needs, our Wilson Park picnic area needs new or reinstalled tables and benches. Uh, you've all heard of Steve's Path in Fairview Park. Well, Wilson Park now ha is called by those of us who go there, Steve's Park. I'm requesting, please, that you look into reinstalling the picnic tables and the picnic benches. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Good evening. My name is Hank Castagnetti. I'm Orange County Model Engineers Liaison to the Fairview Park Steering Committee. And tonight I'm figuratively wearing my engineer's hat. Um, I would just like to mention that we have a recurring problem in Fairview Park with graffiti. When we get graffiti on the railroad uh, infrastructure, it's typically way out in the boondocks. This city has the most amazing graffiti removal team that you could ever ask for. And I would just like to give them a public shout out because Gaetano Russo and his crew respond at the, at the drop of a hat and they get out there and oftentimes they have to wade through the weeds, the grass, they're, they're, they're out there with the snakes and the coyotes <laughs> and they do a marvelous job. So, uh, and I might also say that last Christmas, they responded to a graffiti problem in Fairview Park. And other than uh, the safety personnel on duty in this city, your uh, graffiti com uh, group was working. So I would like to thank uh, Gaetano Russo and all of them uh, on the graffiti team. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay. Seeing no one else in queue for public comments, I'll close them. Um, item number six is commissioner comments, and uh, we will just start to my left. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Um, a couple of things just thinking about in, in as the summer supposedly comes to an end, but it, it seems like it hasn't really got that hot yet, so I think there's still heat to come. Um, but as we're going into back to school season, I know a lot of people are preparing. I know the city has been doing a lot of good work around repainting our uh, crosswalks for the, the families and the kids. Thank you for that. Just would like to encourage the city to continue to look at uh, incorporating art and and um, some fun into those, those um, crosswalks and community painting that's going back together. Also for the community we have coming up, the walk to school day, I believe it's on October 2nd. And so I encourage you to participate as a community in walking to school with your kids and your neighbors um, and encourage the, the city to help to promote that throughout the channels. I'm also really excited to hear more about what's happening in the phase to come about the skate park and some improvements that might be on the agenda going forward there. So I'm um, looking forward to learning more about that from the city. I've recently become the skate park liaison as of last time and I've been very excited about that ever since. Uh, and um, just the other thing, I had one, one note for, uh, for staff, I would love to hear a little bit more about what's happening with the Lions Park, I believe it's the, the airplane park portion of Lions Park that we approved the design for a couple of months back and perhaps get a status update on that uh, in the near future. I understand there, that that has been delayed a little bit and that there has been some interest from the community in opening up that fenced off portion in the meantime. So would love to learn more about that in a, in a meeting coming up and understand if the city has some sort of plan to reopen that to the community in the interim. If we don't have the funding coming in to completely redo that park with the design that we approved, then I would hate to see that really blocked off to the community in the meantime if it's going to be a really long waiting period and maybe there's some sort of in-between that we can do to make that an asset for our community. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, one thing that I would just like to uh, let everyone know is being a city of the arts, I know the next couple of years we're going to be uh, promoting um, some more artistic ways to incorporate that into our city. 
Uh, and one way is you could support local artists. Um, I know on the corner of Fairview and Baker here, there's a little theater called the Starlight Theater. Um, and they have performances this weekend, actually. The little kids are doing the Wizard of Oz. And so it's kids from age like six to 16, I think is this cast. Uh, I went to it last weekend, it was great. I encourage everyone to go out there and enjoy things like that and just continue to support um, any sort of art, whether it's kids or adults uh, in this great city that we have. Thanks. Commissioner Rutherford. Thank you, Chair Erickson. Um, I just want to be brief tonight and um, congratulate Yvette Aguilar for your promotion to acting chair um, and Justin Martin's promotion to acting city manager. We're really excited for your continued service to our city and to keep taking us to our greatest heights. Um, I just want to concur with Commissioner Fay about Lions Park. If we could get an update, if there's any delays, I think that would be important for the commission and the public to know. Um, and then I also want to concur with Commissioner DeSico. Um, I would love us to get any updates about arts activities that are going on in the city. Um, I know that there are some projects that were recently approved by the Cultural Arts Committee, um, for example, a property over on Bristol in the 405. So just curious about the arts activities that are happening and then what that Cultural Arts Committee is approving. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner Ashendorf. Thank you, Chair. A couple of items. Uh, last Saturday was the third of our monthly art walks, and I'm happy to say that I, I won the uh, hula hoop contest um, on Saturday. <laughs> wow. And um, on, on Thursdays, the night we meet, that whole consortium of artists who are now at um, uh, Lions Park are meeting monthly to recap what their what how well it's going and mm -hmm. in future plans. So I invite you to support the uh, the artwork at Lion Art Walk at Lions Park. Um, as far as the senior center is con con concerned, I'd like to share with you on, that on Septem September sixth there will be a tour. Uh, they will be leading to the Museum of Women in Irvine. And uh, another opportunity at the Senior Center is the Christ C Cathedral Sistine Chapel exhibit. There will be a tour of that leaving the center on September 12th. And um, we're happy to say that um, Active Aging Week begins on September 23rd. Relative to the arts, if you haven't seen the Art on the 5th, uh, the opening was last night, the reception was last night, and it continues through the end of September. And finally, um, it's really exciting that at Lions Park, in conjunction with the Orange County, the Dungan Library, there's going to be a cookbook fest on Saturday, October 12th. There will be keynote speakers, um, author panels, a Charlie cart, food truck, and book sales. So um, look for that information to come in the future. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody that our signature art event, Art Venture, is coming up soon on, um, on, in September on the 6th. Uh, the opening will be at the Sagerstrom. So we invite all of you. It's a free event, and you're welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you. And if I will just, uh, as Commissioner comments, um, yeah, pl please make a, uh, an effort to attend uh, the, the art venture. I, I attended last year, had a great time, um, free event, and held at a beautiful uh, facility here in Costa Mesa, the Sagerstrom Center. Um, also, just in looking around, I noticed that the Mesa Water District is conducting some listening tours and kind of open house types of events, not necessarily park related, but for those interested in learning more about how our water gets delivered and um, that infrastructure portion of our city. I'd encourage you to, to look it up. Um, they have a list of weekly uh, listening tours and kind of uh, open community events. So Mesa Water District and um, might be something of interest. And uh, with that, I will close commissioner comments. Item seven, consent calendar. Thank you. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and enacted when one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of the items um, prior to the time the commission votes on the motion unless the members of the commission staff or the public request specific items to be removed from the con consent calendar. 
These items will be discussed and voted upon immediately following commission action on the remainder of the consent calendar. Upon invitation by the chairperson, members of the public who wish to discuss uh, may come forward, state your name, city which you reside, and the item number. If no items are pulled um, for separate discussion, then uh, we will request a motion. And if any items are pulled, we'll read the, uh, the item uh, in, its, in its entirety. So with that, I'd like to ask if any items um, would like to be pulled. Okay. Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion from the commission to approve. I'll motion to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? Yeah, second. Okay, a second from Commissioner Rutherford. Yes. Can you switch to the buttons? Oh, uh, use your mic buttons. Make a motion button, guys. <laughs> Here I am. Sorry, user error. Make motion. Got it. And okay, motion is now closed. And I will call for the question. The motion carries 5 0. <laughs> Item 8A Park Ranger Update. Good evening, Chair Erickson and members of the Commission. Um, thank you, Allison. This evening, we have Sergeant Ball from our very own Costa Mesa Police Department to provide the commission with an overview of some of the responsibilities of the park rangers, as well as some standard protocol of enforcement in our parks. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Sergeant Ball and his team for being here and turn it over to him. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. I'd like to start by uh, talking briefly about uh, the, the role and functions of our uh, park rangers. Um, we have a staff of six park rangers. They work in conjunction uh, with our team, our community policing unit. Um, those uh, park rangers are non-sworn. That means they don't carry guns. They do have tasers and pepper spray. Uh, but unlike our uh, sworn officers like uh, Trevor Jones here, um, they do not carry firearms. Um, they work a variety of shifts, including a uh, uh, day shift every day of the week that starts at uh, 6.30 a.m. until about 4.30 p.m. They also work uh, a night shift from uh, noon or so until 10.30 p.m. We don't have any park rangers that work past 10 unless we're doing a specialized directed enforcement uh, or uh, you know, a lot of them work the fair uh, and different events like that, not necessarily park related. Um, their primary function, uh, con they conduct proactive patrols in the city parks, our recreation facilities, and other designated areas. They do so on foot, by bicycle, or um, most generally you'll see them driving around in their Ford F-150 pickup trucks, the quad cabs, big trucks, black and white trucks. Uh, their job, uh, the mission really is to protect uh, the properties themselves against vandalism, illegal entry, theft, fire, and any other dangers, they observe activity and determine if uh, correction or intervention is required. And that's important to point out that uh, that's part of discretion. Um, and I'm sure we're going to uh, field and I'll answer some questions about uh, how they perform some of those functions. Um, I mentioned six. We currently have one park ranger, Matt Paulo, uh, who has a temporary duty assignment in communications, our dispatch center because of staffing over there. They need some help and we're willing to provide it. So uh, Matt stepped up and he helps out. He does come out on Thursdays and Fridays uh, in the evening to uh, continue his park ranger duties as needed. So, so that's the state of that. Um, are there any questions regarding um, park rangers and, and their functions or would you like me to go into more about their routine uh, patrol? Yeah, okay. So unless we're doing something that is a, uh, what I'll call a direct and enforcement action, um, much like what we did today where we flooded Fairview Park, uh, the north end with a bunch of officers and public services folks and, and rooted out some campers, um, their daily, everyday routine, um, we like them to, and they, they get the direction from the captain, the lieutenant, or myself, um, for our 30 parks, they will uh, ping pong back and forth uh, between each park uh, if there's no calls for service pending in a specific park and look for um, any sort of uh, unruly behavior, um, drinking alcohol in our parks, uh, any disturbances or any unsafe conditions. 
uh, and either report back, ask for help, or handle it. And uh, nine times out of ten, they're able to just handle business and, and get back on patrol. So um, it's not uncommon for uh, our officers to hit either all 30 parks or log 30 patrol checks in any one of, let's just say, maybe a handful, 10 are most active parks. They might hit 10 parks multiple times throughout the day uh, just to make sure that uh, it's a safe and, uh, and, and comfortable environment. Uh, they also interact quite a bit with uh, our persons that are experiencing homelessness in town. Uh, in that regard, uh, they're called upon often to uh, assist with the removal of property, primarily bicycles, uh, when patrol officers might encounter somebody that maybe has a warrant for their arrest and needs to uh, take a ride up to Orange County Jail. Uh, we're, we're responsible for people's property when they get arrested. So they are often called upon because of the use of the truck to uh, move property between maybe the site of the arrest and, and the station for booking. Um, we lately, uh, this year, um, we have uh, responded to uh, thousands of calls for service uh, in the last 233 days of this year. Um, about 1,035 calls for service in Fairview Park alone uh, and several hundred in many of the other parks in town. These folks are constantly busy. Um, there's not a lack of work for them out there. Uh, most of what they do is self-initiated, which means that they go and find the work. And when I say the work, that means either uh, enforcement actions or conditions that might not be safe for, for our residents. So they're very hard workers. Um, they do frequently get calls uh, to a variety of different parks for, for different reasons. Uh, a lot of times it's uh, noise complaints or found property. Uh, found property can be anything from a, uh, a bicycle that's laying unattended in the park to uh, heroin needles and anything in between. So those things do happen and they they handle that. Um, they primarily use our uh, municipal codes for a lot of their enforcement activities. Um, and uh, there are some business and professions codes and some health and safety codes as well. Um, one point I'd like to make, I would say uh, some of the most common uh, violations that they deal with are uh, parking, believe it or not, in our parks, vehicle parking, um, alcohol, um, narcotics, either possession of narcotics or narcotic paraphernalia when they encounter somebody in the park that might be there to, to uh, ingest those substances. Uh, they see that frequently. Uh, those are kind of the top three. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the, the dog off leash or, or some of these other uh, violations. Uh, I mentioned discretion earlier. Uh, park rangers utilize discretion as a, as a tool for education. So if, uh, you know, they encounter uh, somebody, uh, maybe like a group that might be uh, playing uh, uh, frisbee golf or uh, you name the function of 10 or more, we do have an ordinance that, that uh, regulates that. Um, however, their kind of goal is not necessarily to, you know, write 10 citations. That's not what our unit's all about. Uh, it's more about the education. So uh, now if they encounter a group that's uh, unruly and decides they don't want to, uh, you know, heed the, the request of the ranger to stop the activity, whatever illegal that activity that may be, then uh, most likely they would be issuing a citation uh, and taking some sort of enforcement action. But only after that attempt at educating fail. Uh, same with dog off leash or, or uh, any other violation. Uh, I'll tell you right now, I've, I've told our folks often we're zero tolerance on uh, alcohol, drugs, those sorts of things in the park. That's just a, a zero tolerance. We can't, we can't have it. Um, and it conflicts them when we do things like uh, the fish fry with a beer garden and uh, some of our other events that we do where they serve alcohol, but they, they, they do understand. So uh, anyway, any questions regarding the uh, functions or duties or uh, well, enforcement? 
Yeah, first off, thank you for being here. I know it's been a real long day for My you. <laughs> Started before the sun came up, and I understand you had a lot a lot of folks to take care of today. So um, Thank so you for that. Th yeah, no, and thank you for your time and, and educating us as well as the public and, and just to your purpose and how you help us in our parks. Um, with that, are there any qu questions, comments of, of the commissioners? Chair Erickson, I do have a question. Uh -huh. uh, so thank you very much as well for waking up early and coming out to educate us. Just on that education vein, is there anything else for the common... Oh, oh sure. I didn't mean to, yeah. <laughs> There you go. It's hard, yeah. hard to get a place. Okay, thanks. Uh, on the education side of things, is there anything else like the dog off leash that you mentioned or the permitting of groups of 10 or more that would be a good opportunity for a, a quick public service announcement for those in the community right now? You know, What are those common things that your average good community member doesn't know that they need to pay attention to in the parks that you're having to have a conversation with them about? So a lot of enforcement is really driven by, uh, for the rangers and, and officers too, uh, it's really driven by uh, complaints we get. So oftentimes, I used an analogy um, earlier regarding um, traffic and uh, oftentimes we get calls in our traffic division where they say, hey, we've got a speeding problem on 22nd between Santa Ana and Orange and you guys need to get out here and fix it. And uh, and our traffic lieutenant says, all right, guys, four motors, uh, go out there on your motorcycles and start writing citations for those folks that are going 35 and a 25. And, and, and we do that, and they're very effective at it. Um, our park rangers and our community policing unit guys work the same way. We'll get complaints that come through either uh, you know, the chief's office, through, through uh, the, the mayor and city hall. We'll get them through uh, the traffic, uh, off, uh, traffic lieutenant's hotline. We'll get them through a variety of different ways. And, and when we get complaints like that is when we initiate more of the directed enforcement type stuff. So a scenario might be just for example, hey, today, um, there's, uh, you know, dogs running around like crazy in Fairview Park and somebody got bit. Mm -hmm. Somebody gets bit, then we're gonna be out there, not only for uh, a sh kind of a, a show of force, and not I don't mean in a negative way, but hey, we're out here, we're paying attention. Uh, we're gonna make sure that people know one of the reasons that we can't have dogs off leash is there can be some unpredictability with animals. We don't always know what they're gonna do. We always wanna think that our dog's not that one that's gonna bite the kid or bite another dog or anything. But um, it happens, it happens a lot. So, um, and we do, we do have a dog park, you know, we have a dog park where dogs can go and run off leash and that's part of the education aspect of, of that in particular. Um, and it's always a suggestion that's made, you know, if it's, if it's that important, then, you know, head on over to Arlington and Newport. So, I, ho I hope that answers. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay. Ms. Ashendorf. Yes, thank, yeah. thank you, Chair. Um, now, there is a difference between incidents and citations, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, but a citation does generate an incident. Okay, so, um, and we, monthly we receive the um, enforcement summary from the, from the rangers and, and that's really helpful for us to, to kind of keep a tab on what's going on that we really don't see often. But one of the things I wanted to point out was that I've been following in particular Lions Park and there was leading up to the opening of the new Lions Park, there was always concern that there would, there would be a movement over to Lions Park, but apparently the numbers don't uh, show that we're having a lot of incidents or citations issued at the new Lions Park. That's correct, that's fantastic, right? Yes. Um, the reason for that is in part because we did contract with a private security firm to help us out in that regard, uh, and they have been doing a great job. Um, I'm a little critical of their uniform appearance on occasion, but they do a great job. Uh, and, and for that reason, and, and we spend time there too. Um, the park rangers will go by. I've spent some time there checking out the new library and tossing some, some cornhole, cornhole bags out there on the, on the lawn. Um, Perfect. In uniform, which is really hot. But um, we have spent some time there, and um, we haven't taken as many enforcement actions. And I, if, I'm, if I'm right, I think you're looking at the report that that are citations issued? That's correct. Yeah, so we do log incidents there, and that wouldn't necessarily reflect, reflect on the report that you've got, but um, you're seeing the enforcement actions. Perfect, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rutherford. Thank you, I'm Chair Erickson. 
Um, thank you, officer, for being here tonight. I know it's been a long day for you, so you just got to bear with our pesky little questions. It's um, no problem at all, anytime. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, I appreciate you mentioning the group um, policy with permits for using parks. Um, I just want to ask a few questions about that just to break that down a little bit, understand how that's enforced, the procedures that are in place. So what is the process for enforcing um, if there's, you know, 11 people playing soccer in the park without a permit? What would the enforcement look like of something like that that's happening? I can't remember the last time we wrote a citation for that, and, and I didn't pull any of that data for, for this evening, but I can tell you um, my, my unscientific uh, opinion is that we're not writing a lot of those. Uh, it just doesn't happen, and, and the only way that that would happen, again, is if it was generated uh, by a complaint by a member of the public or somebody that was trying to use the park in a way that they were prohibited from doing because of the activity. I don't have uh, personnel out there looking for uh, 10 or more persons so that they can go fang them with a citation. That's just not the, and, and again, if that were to happen where rangers or, or CPU officers were to encounter a group like that, um, if there was some need outside of a complaint, maybe some safety issue, they might mention, uh, hey, you've got 10 or more folks here. Um, you can't do that without a permit. Uh, and again, it, more in the interest of education. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, I, I can tell you right now, we're just not out there hunting for groups of 10 or more to, to do enforcement action on. Sure. Um, and then, so if, if let's say there is a complaint about a group that's in a park, what would be the enforcement action if a complaint is received about a group? Is discretion exercised or are they, would the citation be the go-to process? It really depends on the totality of the circumstances. That's the best way for me to answer. So, I mean, we could go over all kinds of different scenarios and play them out, but I, I, I'll just, I'll say this, it really involves the totality of the circumstances. So if we can alter the behavior that's illegal or not permitted by a simple conversation, we're happy to do that. We're very customer service oriented. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up here in town. My I've got 25 family members that all still live here. They'd be devastated if we all got together in the same park and were told to disband. So um, it's common sense, it's discretion, uh, and education. Okay, gotcha. Um, have you had rangers in the experience? So I appreciate that there's not a lot of citations being issued. But for I'm just, that specific one? For that specific yeah. one. Um, but I'm wondering, so, the, so I mean, if citations aren't being issued, that means people may have been asked to leave parks. So they're exercising discretion, and instead of issuing citations, maybe perhaps rangers are asking groups to leave parks. Is that something that's happening? I can't tell you if it's something that's happening. I just don't know, but I can tell you that that's entirely possible. It's possible. And do you think that would be the go-to approach? If there was a complaint about a group in the park, the go-to approach would be to ask them to leave, but to not issue a citation? I think I would prefer that of my folks, and I think uh, the, 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 the folks playing in the park would appreciate that as well. You know, education's the key. So if we can get compliance by simply talking, you know, we'd rather do that about a lot of things. Uh, there's some things we can't ignore, but there's certainly some things that if we can just change behavior with a simple conversation, it's very helpful. Definitely. So I appreciate you answering that. I'm just going to ask a few more subjective questions. <laughs> Hope you don't mind here. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion of this policy, because I did do a little bit of background research. You know, Irvine, the policy is more than 50 people they need a permit. Orange, it's more than 25 people. Long Beach, it's also more than 25 people. So do you think that this having this code on the books is really enhancing public safety? Or do you think that these groups in parks are not posing a threat to public safety? So with all due respect, I'm not going to answer with an opinion um, because we don't make the rules. You know, we just have to go out and enforce them. So um, I'm going to leave that for you folks and uh, counsel and, and attorneys to figure out. I, I can't give an opinion on that. Definitely. Um, maybe if this question is less subjective, if this policy um, weren't in place, or let's say Costa Mesa had 25 people as the limit like some other cities do, would that make the jobs of some park rangers easier if they had 
um, less to worry about? Again, that's a hard one. You know, um, I can't really answer that. Um, yeah, I, 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 and I don't mean that to be disrespectful sure. whatsoever. I just, I can't go down that road. That's fair. Um, and then I just wanted to ask the same question about um, a different municipal code, section 4.3, as it relates to bicycle permits and the rules um, for parking bicycles away from bicycle racks. Is the citation process similar with regards to those sections of municipal code? What is the enforcement process like with regards to bicycles, bicycle permits, bicycle registration, and bike parking? So that one's a, a, a really important tool for us. Uh, very, very valuable. Uh, bike licensing allows us to, um, when somebody comes in to get a bike license at the front desk or at the fire station, um, we get a copy of the serial number on the bike. And then we also issue a sticker with another number that goes directly on the bike. Um, we have uh, a pretty considerable problem with bike theft in town. Uh, so it, it helps us identify potentially stolen property. Um, it gives uh, uh, our officers a, uh, just a tool to be able to say, hey, you know, we found this really nice, very expensive mountain bike and the person that's riding it just really doesn't look like this should, it should be his bike, you know. We saw many bikes today down in Fairview Park that just simply didn't belong and we ended up impounding those bikes. Several of those bikes did not have bike licenses. We can run the serial number, but unless the serial number is uh, registered or provided in a police report, uh, when it was stolen, we have no way of knowing who that bike belongs to unless it's licensed. So it's a huge tool for us. And we only enforce that. Again, that's another one of those that's really important for education. Uh, we like that. We like to have that license on the bike. It makes our job easier. We have thousands of bikes right now down at the West Side substation that are basically, we, we've recovered them uh, in a variety of different ways, either uh, abandoned property, found property, or um, they don't have a license and they've been uh, uh, removed from uh, a person that's been arrested or whatnot. There's thousands of them. We can't identify the owners of, on the bikes. And some of them are beautiful bikes, very expensive bikes. Um, so it's, a, it's an enforcer, it's a, not an enforcement tool, it's an investigative tool for us that's uh, super important. And then just one last question. Um, so with regards to the bicycle registration, I appreciate you about outlining that process. Um, what about the policy about bicycle parking? And you know, there, people are not allowed to park their bicycles outside of a bicycle rack. What is the enforcement process like for that policy? So that's kind of a quality of life uh, issue. Um, the parks that have bike racks will require that bikes be parked in uh, the bike rack, much like uh, uh, like a, a vehicle, like a car, um, they, uh, the, the, the bikes not inside of a rack tend to um, diminish the look of a location. Uh, we don't know oftentimes if they are um, uh, stolen, lost, uh, uh, there's a variety of uh, factors. So what we, what we can definitely tell though is if somebody locks their bike up to a bike rack, it's out of the way. There's no safety issue with somebody stumbling over a, a bike, which would happen frequently in, in Lions Park back before uh, the library and, and whatnot. This is a couple years back. Um, people running through the park and tripping over a bike, uh, a variety of different safety issues related to that. Um, it's a cleaner look um, rather than having uh, bikes kind of strewn all over the park. Um, so it's that's, that's an important aspect uh, in terms of um, just keeping an orderly park. Um, the parks that don't have bike racks, I don't know that we have too many, we might, um, but uh, the parks that don't have bike racks, we don't enforce that. And we always try and find the owners too. You know, if we think we can find an owner to the bike, you know, we'll ask, hey, can, can you lock that thing up? And then, um my last question is, if you're issuing a citation for those bicycle policies, what is the citation fee for um, an unattended bicycle or for a bicycle that doesn't have a registration if there's an enforcement action? 
I don't know that off the top of my head. I apologize. I can get that for you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, you Sergeant. Um, Commissioner DeSico? Yeah, first off, I want to thank you, uh, Sergeant Deball, for everything you do for this city to serve and protect. I know you're heavily vested in this city, so thank you to you and your department. I appreciate that. Keeping it a place we all want to live. Um, and thank you for clarifying some of the citation, the difference between a citation and an incident, that not every incident uh, requires a citation, that education is your primary tool that you guys use. I appreciate that. Uh, I know the public does too. Um, also, I ha uh, initially had questions about the bicycle license required. Um, I have two daughters that have bicycles, and I had never heard of this. Um, they would be in violation of this, so that might be something I need to get rectified, and possibly something that we need to educate the public, because it's frankly something I didn't know about. I think uh, uh, Chair Erickson had an event was it last year where they issued some bicycle licenses at an event at Polaric Park? Uh, it was actually at a local school, oh, a school. where uh, the police came out during a bike to school event and um, handed out bicycle licenses to the kids. And it was a great educational experience and the kids got an understanding of why the license was important. So I'm sure the city um, you know, can find more avenues to educate like, like that. Yeah, yeah, and I hope we look forward to continue to do that, but it helps me understand now why that ordinance is on there and that it is a tool that you guys can use to return people's property um, to them. So I appreciate that explanation. Um, also, I know we've been adding bicycle racks to parks and um, maybe Bruce can, um, are, about how many parks are still lacking on bicycle racks? I know you, we've been working on that. Um, I've seen them popping up everywhere, so. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner DeSecco. Um, currently, we're at about 95% of the parks have bike racks. A uh, quick count here shows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. eight currently without bike racks. We have 20 bike racks to be installed in the corporation yard right now, as well as a grant pending for next year and the purchase of more bike racks. And there'll be custom bike racks, as you may have seen in some of the spots. The bike racks currently at the skate park are scheduled to be replaced with some a uh, little bit more like skateboarding or a tennis type bike racks will be going in soon there. And the new library will also be getting a custom bike rack that has it's like in the shape of books or something like that. As well as Fairview Park, we're discussing some uh, kind of environmentally friendly bike racks for that area. Great, thank you so much for that. And I'm glad we're installing those and hopefully that gives people no reason to be leaving bikes around the park for the reasons that you gave. So I hopefully can we can help that, you. That also um, helps uh, eliminate and reduce uh, theft as well. And that's a big factor. Great. Um, I did have a question on the one ordinance, the 1253A. Um, that was already brought up, the permits needed for groups of 10 or more persons. If you could bring up maybe some of the reasons why that is an important ordinance and why um, that could be uh, something that we do need to force in certain situations. Well, you know, the, the, when you get groups together, uh, 10 or more, um, there, it could have an impact on other park patrons in terms of either safety or park usage. Um, you know, one of the factors uh, back in the late 90s that when this came around was um, overuse. That was a big factor at Fairview Park, for example. Uh, there was also, uh, I remember, complaints about uh, noise and um, nefarious characters being uh, present and, and trash and a variety of different things that, that kind of pushed that along. Um, how anybody came to decide on the number 10, I, I have no idea. Um, but uh, from what I remember way back when, that was uh, kind of the driving force behind it. Okay. And um, I know you wouldn't know offhand the number of incidents because it sounds like that's not a citation commonly written for. Um, and I know you wouldn't know offhand the number of incidents. Is that something the city could look into, the number of incidents um, that that's occurred maybe over the last year or two? Yeah, we can get that information. Okay, but yeah, that would be good. Um, and I think those are all my questions. Again, thank you so much for all you do for our city. Thank you for that. Okay, with respect to the sergeant's time, I'm gonna allow one more speaker.
Um, Cassius, no, Chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Rutherford. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you, Chair Erickson. Thank you again, Sergeant. Um, just wanted to ask this question to um, Acting Chair Aguilar. I submitted a public records request four weeks ago, I believe, five weeks ago, about the citation policies. So I know, you know, there's limited staff time and limited resources. So I mean, there's not a rush on getting that information, but I would definitely like to see if we could get records of the citation history. We can follow up and see where the request is. Well, thank you. All right. Well, with that, I'd like to dismiss the sergeant. Thank you so much for your time and for the long day you put in. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioners, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. With that, we'll move on to the next presentation. Item 8B, spring at a glance. Chair Erickson and commissioners, um, this evening we've invited Assistant Recreation Supervisor William Lund and Recreation Coordinator Paul Nguyen uh, to provide us provide the commission with a wrap up of the spring season in our department. As a reminder, uh, we wrap up the summer programs uh, this coming week, um, and the commission can look forward to the highlight of the summer programs in the fall. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Lund and Mr. Nguyen. Thank you. Um, Good evening, Chair Erickson, Commissioners. Uh, my name is William Lund, and I am an Assistant Recreation Supervisor for the Parks and Community Services Department. And my name is Paul Nguyen, and I'm a Recreation Coordinator for the Department. Uh, and as Yvette mentioned, uh, we're here to provide you updates to the programs and services provided to the community for the spring 2019 season. Um, the Parks and Community Services Department is proud of the youth programs that were offered over this past spring. Um, some of these programs are uh, the ROCKS program, which is our after-school program, uh, Spring Camp Costa Mesa, the LEAP program, Youth Volleyball, the Teen program, and the Mobile Recreation program. The LEAP program is a fee-based early childhood program for children uh, three to five years old. Classes are split between three to four-year-olds who meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and four to five-year-olds who meet on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> Uh, an average of 76 participants partook in activities that included cooking, science experiments, music, guest speakers, and crafts. Uh, the ROCKS program is a fee-based program, which is held after school at 11 Newport Mesa Unified Elementary School sites. During the spring, 922 participants were provided homework help, group games, arts and crafts, and sports. In addition, nine sites received a free daily snack provided by the district's national school lunch program, which consists of food and a drink component. Uh, the fee-based spring week Camp Costa Mesa met during the holiday week in April and was available to children in kindergarten through sixth grade. Filled to capacity, these 50 campers actively participate in group games, sports, and arts and crafts. And the highlight of the week uh, is embarking on trips to Concourse Bowling, Disneyland, and Tanaka Farms. The youth volleyball program is a free and open to children in grades first through eighth. This spring season, there were a total of four teams for the A and B division, fourth through eighth graders, which had 30 participants enrolled. The non-competitive division for first to third graders had 25 participants, and season total for the entire program reached 55 participants. Teams practiced twice a week at the Downtown Recreation Center and Teamwinkle Middle School Gym. Games were held on Saturdays at the Downtown Recreation Center. Back for its third year after a long hiatus, the Mobile Recreation Program is bringing fun activities to local neighborhoods and communities that lack convenient access to park spaces. The program served over 750 children throughout the city and provided activities such as homework assistance, sports, arts and crafts, and a mobile library. This free program runs Monday through Saturday and visits five locations weekly for three hours each day. Locations change on a monthly basis. Locations visited during the spring season include Shalomar, Jordan Park, Pamela Lane, Fillmore Way, Vista Park, Wilson Park, and Lions Park. The mobile recreation truck is also a familiar site as city and community run special events, visiting the Easter event, Excitement, Relay for Life, and the Lions Park kickoff. Uh, for the Downtown Recreation Center, um, this center is operated for about 15 hours a day on weekdays during the spring for youth, teen, and adult programming. Uh, the facility features a gymnasium, a gymnastics room, a multi-purpose room, 
a classroom, a pool, and houses several of the parks and community services uh, programs. The adult sports program operates out of the downtown recreation center and the Tewinkle Sports Complex, consisting of open gym basketball, futsal, pickleball, volleyball, adult basketball, adult softball. Uh, these programs generated a combined attendance of 2,100 participants. The adult basketball league re reached a capacity of nine teams and 140 participants, with the, and the uh, adult softball league had 104 teams for its spring season. Alongside the Downtown Recreation Center is the Downtown Aquatic Center, which offers adult lap swim, youth and adult swim lessons, and a junior guard prep class. The adult lap swim pro provided four swimming lanes on weekday mornings and afternoons. Swimmers were provided workout equipment, such as kickboards, fins, pool buoys, to enhance their lap swimming experience. Spring attendance approached about 1,000 swimmers. Uh, for adult lessons, uh, this, these swim lessons and water aerobics were also offered for adults this spring season. Uh, 70 adults participated in, in these instructional and aerobics-based classes. Youth swim lessons increased in participation in the spring season as summer approaches, with nearly 350 children enrolled in lessons from March through June. Uh, junior guard prep also took place this spring. Uh, this program is tailored for swimmers ages 9 to 15, looking to meet the physical fitness requirements of junior lifeguard programs in Newport Beach and Huntington Beach for the upcoming summer. A total of 20 swimmers worked, out, worked on building their overall swimming in endurance, speed, and treading water through drills and instruction. On June 21st, the Downtown Aquatic Center participated in the world's largest swim lesson. The world's largest swim lesson is an international event with water safety organizations joining together to build awareness about the vital importance of teaching children how to swim to prevent drowning. 25 participants joined our aquatic staff for this free event. The Downtown Recreation Center is also home to one of three teen centers. The other two teen centers are located at Teen Winkle Middle School, Costa Mesa Middle School. Teens in grades 7 through 12 come to the teen center on a drop-in basis to socialize with friends, play games, engage in art projects, and complete homework and school projects. Teens from neighboring schools such as Enton Intermediate and Newport Harbor High School are provided the opportunity to utilize the teen center with transportation from staff in city vans. The program had 212 registrants and an average daily attendance of 64 teens. The team program also offered several special events, including service opportunities, cleaning local parks and beaches, a capture the flag competition with Save Our Youth, and a murder mystery dinner, which where participants were tasked with the following clues throughout the Downtown Recreation Center to solve the mysterious death of a CPR dummy. Attendance at each of these teen events ranged from 20 to 50 teens. Within the Downtown Recreation Center, and Blair Community Center, rooms are made available for public rentals for meetings, parties, and private events. Also offered in the Downtown Recreation Center, Blair Community Center, and Costa Mesa Senior Center are contract classes. These classes are designed to serve residents of all ages and include activities such as gymnastics, art, soccer, yoga, archery, karate, and foreign language literacy. Other contract classes not held at city facilities are considered partnerships and are held at the contractor's uh, agency locations. 226 classes were offered for the spring season with a total of 747 re registrants. Eight of these class offerings were brand new. At the Senior Center, there are currently 2,200 active members where membership is free to anyone over the age of 50. This spring, the center provided an array of activities, health and wellness presentations, health screenings, community trips, special events, and fitness classes. For some of these programs, the center partnered with agencies such as Hogue Hospital, Human Care Options, OC, Her OC Health Care Agency, and the American Association of Retired Persons. The center held more than 20 presentations and workshops. On Saturday, May 11th, the Costa Mesa Senior Center hosted its annual Mother's Day brunch for its participants and family members. Attendees enjoyed pastries from Portals, a full breakfast, live music from Lisa Wallace on her harp. Other spring events include 
a Parisian themed prom titled An Evening in Paris and an Independence Day Luau lunch featuring real Polynesian dancers. Costa Mesa police officers and firefighters were on hand to assist by serving lunch to the 90 attendees. During the week of April 29th through May 3rd, the Costa Mesa Senior Center partnered with the Downtown Recreation Center to hold its first annual Golden Age Games. The games featured three sports, table tennis, billiards, and pickleball at the Downtown Recreation Center. With more than 55 participants, the games were a resounding success with competitors from all sports giving one piece of feedback to the organizers. You have to do this more than once a year. <laughs> Two other popular programs the Senior Center provides are the travel and community trips programs. This spring, participants ventured to Las Vegas for a two-night stay at the Gold Nugget Casino, a trip to the Pala Casino, San Diego for a tour of Little Italy and Coronado Island, Heroes Hall at the OC Fairgrounds, and Marconi Automotive, Automotive Museum in Tustin. Animal Care Services successfully continued services with Newport Center Animal Hospital at the, as the city's contracted animal shelter and Priceless Pet Rescue as the animal's adoption service provider. In April, City Council approved the long-term contract extensions for both vendors. While in the shelter's care, animals receive a veterinary examination, which include vaccinations, a microchip, and were spayed, spayed or neutered. A total of 229 Costa Mesa animals were sheltered this spring, and a total of 42 animals were returned to their owners. 153 Costa Mesa animals were transferred to Priceless Pet Rescue this spring, and 79 of Costa Mesa's adoptable animals found new homes. In addition, Animal Care Services was also busy hosting and participating in events such as the Priceless Pet Rescue's packed walk at Team Local Park, the pop-up dog adoption at the, event, at the Lions Park event lawn, and Dog Fest. The dog park is a large fenced area designated for the public to take their dogs to exercise and socialize in an off-leash setting. The park is divided into two separate areas for large dogs and for small dogs. The park is very popular among Costa Mesa residents and visitors from neighboring cities. As a result, the Bark Park was voted as one of the top three dog parks in Orange County in the best of OC Magazine. In addition, the Bark Park hosted the annual Spring Bark Bash, which attracted nearly 200 attendees and included 16 local pet vendors, three animal rescue groups, and a canine costume contest. Our very own Parks and Community Services Acting Director, Yvette Aguilar, adopted her new furry companion, Benji, from Priceless Pet Rescue. Several events led by Fairview Park Administrator Cynthia D'Agosta took place at Fairview Park this past spring, including Earth Day, which included restoration projects and informational walking tours, I Love Costa Mesa Day, which included volunteer services to remove non-native plant species from Canyon and Fairview Park, as well as a bio blitz conducted by Pacifica Christian High School students to in inventory species found throughout Canyon Park, and uh, also National Trails Day, where community members planted native species such as prickly pear and gum plant to promote the use of established trails throughout the park area. The city also has uh, two community gardens with a total of 102 parcels, 60 are at the Del Mar Garden and 42 are at the Hamilton Garden, uh, one of which at Hamilton is managed by the Costa Mesa Senior Center. This May, one of six yearly work parties took place in the spring season Work parties are not only opportunities to fulfill the annual four-hour community service requirement for gardeners, but also an opportunity for gardeners to meet, work, and socialize with other gardeners and city staff. This spring, a partnership was formed with the Orange County Master Gardeners, who provided two presentations to gardeners. Topics include gardening in small spaces and garden plants to attract butterflies. In June, the Parks and Community Services Department began programming the newly opened Lions Park event lawn. This one acre open space has become home to special events and ongoing activities. Special events held included Kites and Bites, where families assembled and decorated kites, enjoyed food from local restaurant Toast, and played lawn games. The Dr. Seuss Reading Program, which was led by the OC Public Library and the South Coast Alumni Club, Pi Beta Phi, the Art Walk, which is held on the third Saturday, Saturday monthly and features an art exhibition, dance battle, a DJ, and silent disco. 
And finally, the first ever Parks and Community Services Department summer kickoff. This event featured games, recreational activities, class demonstration, and local community vendors. Ongoing activities at the event lawn include mobile recreation, disc golf, interactive theater, lawn games, and the craft in the, arc, the, craft in the park program. The craft in the park program is held on Thursdays and offers a new craft each week, often themed for popular holidays such as Father's Day and Independence Day. Activities and events can be found on the Lions Park event lawn calendar on the city website. Uh, for arts and culture, uh, the Cultural Arts Committee led several programs and initiatives this spring, including the Youth Art Gallery, the Exhibit Gallery, Art on the Fifth, Utility Box Art, the Portrait Series, Art Grants, the Arts and Cultural Master Plan, and a Directory of Local Artists. Through these programs, local artistic talent has been supported through grants and the Master Plan, and showcased through galleries and public art pieces in city facilities, public spaces, and online. Our department had a busy and enjoyable spring season, providing activities, events, and services to the community. This concludes our presentation. Uh, we'd like to thank you, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, staff. That was an impressive <laughs> presentation. It's always amazing how much stuff's going on, so thank you for all you do. Um, for the commission, uh, are there any questions? I'll second that, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I did it right. Hi, uh, thank you so much, that was great. Just uh, one question, it might not be for you two who did such a great job presenting, but maybe it, it's to staff. Um, wondering if we could perhaps get an update on the next steps on the art and culture master plan. I believe it went to council and just kind of where that's at and what maybe how that might dovetail into what comes in the season ahead. Commissioner, that's actually in the queue to go to council um, okay. in uh, an upcoming meeting. Okay, it hasn't gone yet. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. Yes, and I had a question. Uh, again, thanks for that presentation. Very thorough and not everything that's happening. I did have a question on one of those slides that did show uh, something around 200 classes and maybe 700 participants which rough math, maybe that's a little over three people per class, uh, which would seem very low to me. Uh, and makes me beg the question, at what point would staff of the city assess whether a class is worth holding um, and worth continuing? Or at what point would they choose to um, discontinue something that may not be as popular as other things? And I don't know if you guys would answer that or uh, if city would. Sure, Commissioner DeSico, uh, the classes are held by independent instructors and each class has a minimum and maximum enrollment. So as long as we're meeting those minimums so that the instructor is benefiting from um, offering the class, we will continue the class. And the 700, um, or there are a lot of duplicate numbers in, in um, enrollment for those classes as well. So that's something that's not really flushed out. Um, but the classes that do run, it's because they're at least me meeting that minimum enrollment. So the, those numbers were just specific to the ones that are independently held, not the ones using city staff members to run them, is that correct? Correct, Cl contract okay. classes. Okay, contract classes, thank you for that. And then how do we as a city for city run programs decide if we should continue a program or maybe discontinue a program? Um, how are those decisions made? I think specifically one that I noticed is pretty low for the number of hours that we're staffing versus the usage might um, be the mobile rec center, which I think uh, is really well utilized in a lot of new events. But as a standalone, um, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm wondering how much is that costing the city versus how much are people utilizing it? How are those decisions made? The mobile um, recreation program actually came back to the city um, via direction of the council. Um, so we we moved the, the vehicle a lot and we assess attendance and um, figure out new locations um, and publicize it. And we put it out at a lot of our public events, um, but we have a budget for that. Um, and so as long as we're not exceeding that budget um, and there is a quality for the program and that people are still benefiting from it. Um, I know in the summer we hit pretty high numbers. Um, in July we had more than 1,000 
thousand in attendance. Um, so we'd have to look at that data, but um, it's been a successful program. Um, so it's not an item that we would actually, or a program that we would pull um, based on one month of numbers. Sure, and not specifically that program. I'm just wondering if you guys have a general way that these decisions are made or a general protocol of how you evaluate whether something's being effective or not effective. Really, we look at attendance for something like that and make sure that um, we we don't want to pull a program if there are people that are using it, and so we're very mindful of that. Um, we also um, we give out handout surveys um, to solicit that feedback from the public that we're serving. Okay, and then my last question. Uh, I know I utilize a lot of these programs actually through the city. I really appreciate it. Uh, one of the things I find Amazing is the low or no cost to many of these programs, um, which is an amazing service to our community, and I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, but I do know somebody's paying for that, um, usually the taxpayers. One thing that I do have interest in seeing if this is a possibility in all of these programs when people are signing up, if there would be a donation option um, that people could donate to maybe come up with three or four causes uh, that are related to city parks or um, that people could, let's say I'm signing up for a free class, but maybe I would I would wanna donate $25 towards a specific cause, whether that's improvement of a park or building of something else um, or upgrading fields, you know, artificial turf, we don't have a lot of those. What would be the process of adding a, a possible donation ability when people are signing up for these low or no cost options? It actually already exists, um, and we do it through the Costa Mesa Foundation. So we do have some um, funds to allocate funding for those um, types of activities. We can definitely do a better job of promoting it, though. So when I go to sign up for the class online, that donation button comes up as I'm signing up? It doesn't have that functionality, but like I said, we can do a better job of promoting that information. So who would be the person in charge of adding that as a function when they're signing up? What department would that be? It would be our department. We actually have okay. to look into how to do that, but it's something, like I said, we can do a better job of promoting it. Um, there is a way to donate online, um, right. so we can definitely uh, share that link and information with the public. Yeah, that'd be great, especially if it was put on the exact same place that they're signing up. I think we would probably get more donations that way. That'd be great. Thank you. And thank you guys for the presentation. Thank you, staff. And again, um, seeing no more comments in queue, uh, let's move on to item C. Item 8C, biannual transportation update. Um, Commissioner er or Chair Erickson and Commissioners, again, um, for the third and final presentation of the evening, um, I'd like to welcome and introduce Recreation Coordinator Angel Berfranco, who is here this evening to share an update about the transportation program that runs out of the Costa Mesa Senior Center. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and Parks and Arts and Community Services Commissioners. My name is Angel Berfreco, Recreation Coordinator for the Parks and Community Services Department. This evening, I will be presenting on the transportation program at the Costa Mesa Senior Center. The program is made of two transportation programs. The Senior Mobility Program, or SMP, offers door-to-door -door services to participants in Costa Mesa, to the Senior Center, and for shopping trips, personal care, social recreational trips, as well as many other trips in Orange County. The second program is the Medical Transportation Program, or MTP, which offers medical transportation to local hospitals, pharmacies, and related health and wellness conferences and seminars in Orange County. The Costa Mesa Senior Center began its expansion of services for transportation in October 2017. The Senior Center added a scheduler to the program and expanded the number of ways participants could schedule rides. With the expansion, participants could now request rides in advance and on standing requests for the month. This new method of requesting rides became popular for SMP participants, which allowed the scheduler to increase the number of routes and the driver's drive time. The transportation program continues to seek and receive feedback on processing, scheduling, and general transportation related items through surveys, telephones, and direct staff communication. SMP receives funding through OCTA by Measure M2 funds 
and was awarded the Enhanced Mobility for Seniors and Disabled or EMSD grant for a new shuttle. The new shuttle will be a 16-person shuttle with foldable seats to fit two wheelchairs and 12 participants. The EMSD grant is funding 80% of the cost for the new shuttle, which is approximately $70,000, and the City of Costa Mesa will be paying the remaining balance. The shuttle is currently scheduled to complete production on August 28th, and we anticipate a delivery of mid-September. For SMP, the city provides in-kind services to match at least 20% of the cost for the program. In-kind services include a recreation coordinator, recreation specialist, schedule router, backup router, fuel, vehicle maintenance, and related vehicle costs for the program. MTP is funded by the Hope Community Benefit Grant in the sum of $75,000. Due to the restructuring of the grant, only community partners invited to apply for the grant are being permitted to apply for funding in 2020. The Costa Mesa Senior Center continues to be one of the partners fortunate enough to be invited to apply for the 2020 calendar year. The Senior Center provides similar in-kind services for MTP as are offered for SMP. Participants registered for both programs need to be registered Costa Mesa Senior Center participants, must be 60 and older, must be Costa Mesa residents, and exhibit independence and ability for self-care. As always, all services for transportation are completely free of cost. These are layouts of the shuttle purchase with the funding received from EMSD grants that show the exterior of the shuttle. This is a layout of the seats and the modifications to the back of the shuttle to accommodate two wheelchairs. And this is a photo of the shuttle we anticipate to receive. Both SMP and MTP accept reservations via phone or in writing. Reservations can be made with the router for the program or at the front desk for, of the senior center. Due to its demand, MTP begins to take requests uh, on the 15th day of each month for the following month and SMP one week before the end of the month. Taxis are available for participants who are unable to be added to a schedule and a second part-time driver operates the, uh, the second shuttle for SMP to allow the center to operate community trips. <clears throat> From the tra transition with a nonprofit at the Senior Center, the transportation program participants had limited interaction with Senior Center staff as participants scheduled primarily with drivers. This made addressing any issues that came up with participants scheduled pickups difficult for staff and specialists for the program. The expansion created multiple avenues by which they could schedule ride requests for senior mobility since most participants are mobile and move around easily. The preferred method of ride request became forms and for medical transportation. Clients who use the program for dialysis or other medical purposes, the preferred method of scheduling became phone. This also increased interaction between participants and senior center staff who have access to all scheduled routes now. During the expansion, the senior center also established a transportation office at the front desk. The expansion, additions, and changes have helped optimize the program and now the driver's drive time for the program has been increased, which is one of the reasons SMP has recorded a record number of rides this past 18-19 fiscal year, with 7,138 rides completed. One of the other reasons for this incredible growth has been the continued success of the Community Trips program. From its launch, Community Trips were only offered once a month. Now Community Trips are being offered a minimum of twice a month, with trips filled up, with trips filling up the same day they open for registration. The program has taken participants to museums, musical performances, cultural events in Costa Mesa, and all around Orange County. This program has brought sociability and exposure to the community back to all senior center participants. Between the funding and the grants awarded to the senior center for the two transportation programs, we are currently managing more than $250,000 in grants and M2 funding. The senior mobility program, which is funded by M2 funds with its current number of rides and total cost of the program for 18-19 fiscal year was able to get its cost per ride down to $15.67. This is significant because OCTA access program averages $50 per ride and between all the cities in the county that offer an SMP program through OCTA, the city of Costa Mesa is below the average for the county which is approximately $20 per ride. 
Given our current success with transportation, we look forward to continuing this trend and have set some goals for ourselves we hope to accomplish in the next three to five years as funding becomes available. These are the contact numbers for the program, and at this time I can answer any questions from the Commission. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'll, I'll start with just one. Um, I noticed that the transportation was eligible to people, I believe it was 60 and over, mm -hmm. and the um, senior center is eligible to people 50 and over. Um, is there a, a reason for the, the break, um, the 10 year gap, if someone has the need at, at, at 50, 55, whatever? So the reason for that is actually because of agreements with OCTA and with um, grant requirements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Ashendorf. Thank you. Um, congratulations, Mr. Franco. The transition throughout the transportation pro process has been challenging and we can see a real major success in how it's been run the last year. I was curious to know though, have you had any interest with the seniors in inquiring on how they could use Uber or Lyft, um, perhaps classes on downloading apps or making that available. I just heard a study on NPR recently and they, they um, USC interviewed 185 seniors and who had never heard of Uber and Lyft, and they provided the service for them th through a grant, and it received 100% um, satisfaction that they didn't have to have the fear of a taxi driver or wait for another bus. And I was just wondering if there was any interest in uh, that kind of transportation at the center. So at this time, we haven't seen any interest from okay. our seniors for anything related to Lyft or Uber. Um, if that did come up, we can definitely address that and bring a seminar or a presentation that would address those interests. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner DeSico? Yeah, I just had a couple questions. Uh, one of the criteria it mentioned, be able to complete self-care um, for the person. If they had a caregiver that was able to help them with that, would the person be eligible or did they have to physically be doing that? If they have a caregiver, the caregiver can come on the rights with them. Right. They just need to notify that to our router so that we can um, make sure that there's a seat available for them and then they are more than welcome to use the program. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and then one of the things, it's a no cost to them. Is that also due to the grants or what was the thought process with no cost versus low cost? So that is not part of the grant requirements. We can um, apply a fee to this program. However, we have chosen not to, um, and many other cities that actually do charge for the program are actually much higher in their cost per ride than we are right now. Correct. Correct. Uh, and for cancellations, is there any policy or charge for that for canceling uh, appointments made? There's no charge or anything like that for cancellations. Okay. And then I also saw two ADA accessible vans as a possibility in the future. Can you let me know the thought process um, behind maybe requiring those versus using what we currently have? Accessibility to apartment houses. Um, some of the apartment houses in Costa Mesa our shuttle actually can't get into, and so some participants are required to come out. Um, and having two ADA accessible vans would definitely make that easier for our participants and for our drivers to have access to those people. So is it mainly for uh, those instances in apartment homes or is it a lower cost to run uh, one van for one person versus running that bus for one person if one person was utilizing it? it is it a cost benefit or is it more an accessibility issue? It could be both. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rutherford. Yeah, thank you, Chair Erickson. Um, thank you for the update. I also want to second what Commissioner Ashendorf said about um, congratulating you and your team on the work that's been done to get the numbers to this point where there's been this much of an increase over last year. And I just want to comment briefly, I think that's reflective of a broader overall trend that a lot of people in SoCal are just getting totally fed up with other transportation options. Metrolink last year logged the highest ridership ever in the history 
of their operation in SoCal. So I think there is a trend going. Um, to Commissioner Ashendorf's remark about potentially using Uber or Lyft, I know there was a shuttle service that opened recently um, in Mission Viejo, also one in Carlsbad that it's designed for commuters and they can request the city shuttle on their app, on their phone and um, pick up a ride that way. I'm wondering if there's any possibility of integrating this transit service with the My Costa Mesa app for something like that. So that transit service right now is actually in a pilot program and they're looking to target specific cities and areas that are underserved with that. Do you think there would be any possibility of integrating this transit service with the My Costa Mesa app? Is that something that's been thought of, explored at all? Is there enough usage among the senior population to justify that? For the pilot that was launched in Mission Viejo, um, there could be, but they're really targeting specific areas. We can speak to the coordinator to see what their uh, process is behind it, but there are other cities that they're um, prioritizing before Costa Mesa, only because of the services that are currently offered here. Got you. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that it could potentially come to the point where there's those conversations about syncing with the My Costa Mesa app for the service in Costa Mesa? Sure. Cool. Thank you. Commissioner Fay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think it is excellent that our city is investing in this. Thank you for improving the program. Uh, I think that this is a critical service for our city. And I, I'd like to take it a step further from what Commissioner Ashendorf had said around the Uber and the Lyft side of things. I think I'd really encourage us as a city to be proactive in educating and integrating things like Commissioner Rutherford said as well around technology. Uh, helping care for a senior parent myself. I, I've had experience with trying to book rides and, and working through all of this and trying to book Ubers, and I'm sure many in the community have. And we've got to be more proactive in, in bringing, educating our seniors, bringing them on board with things that can be easily accessible to them. Um, and it would be great if we thought about how that, that this could, tra our program, if we can keep it going, can be trans. Um, translated into a really accessible, easy app, whether it's My Costa Mesa app or something else. I think, secondly, it would also be great if we could proactively look at educating our seniors. Um, we do a great job of educating our, our seniors through the Senior Center on a number of things, but if we could proactively look at educating our seniors on services like Uber and Lyft, because uh, as you show, it's a very busy service and there's not always availability for everyone and there's often late last minute appointments that people need to go to or cancel. So it would be great if they have, um, we could help our community in learning about that. And thank you for not having any cancellation fees because I'm sure that's really a helpful thing to our community with our seniors often waking up in the morning and not feeling good enough for that doctor's appointment. And uh, so I think it's really great that we don't have cancellation fees and can be flexible with what their needs are in our community. All right. Thank you so much for staff uh, being here in the presentation. Really appreciate it. And uh, at this time, we're going to move on to item nine. Item nine, old business, no items. Item 10A, new business, tree removal request 980 Presidio Drive. Good evening, commissioner, commissioners, and congratulations, Chairman Erickson. Um, tonight, we have a tree removal request at 980 Presidio Drive. The tree is an American sweet gum. The height of the tree is approximately 35 to 45 foot, 45 foot tall. The right of way, the setback from the curb is 10 feet, the city's property, and the tree was last maintained in 2015. The tree is actually on DeSoto Street. Here's a view from the sidewalk looking at the tree and the wall. Another view of the cracks in the concrete adjacent to the tree. Here's a view of the tree from across the street. The tree has been uh, evaluated by the city arborist and the tree is in good health and overall a, a very uh, healthy tree. This is the view facing north looking at Presidio Drive. And here's a view from Presidio Drive looking at the tree from um, 
looking south. This view shows the parkway, the curb, and the fence where the tree is growing, and a good uh, view of the tree trunk. Oops. That wasn't supposed to happen. And that, oh, there it goes. That is the last of the photos. Um, Mr. Ortiz, the city arborist, can speak to you about the health of the tree and any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. At this time, um, if there are any questions, uh, discussion amongst the commissioners or questions for the arborist, I'll open it up. Um, uh, well, Commissioner Erickson? Yes. Oh, Chair, Chairman Erickson, sorry about that. Uh -huh. The applicants are here as well, uh -huh. and may, they would like an opportunity to speak after your uh, remarks. Fantastic, yeah, certainly allow that. Um, Anyone on the dais questions for staff? Okay. Commissioner Rutherford. Thank you, Chair Erickson. Um, thank you, Jim, for being here tonight. I was just asking, I just wanted to ask, what is the condition of the tree? What is your assessment of the health and safety risks posed by the tree? Do you have any comments about the tree? So the tree is healthy. Um, it meets the, the tree risk requirement for that tree. Um, there's no health issues with the tree at all. It's healthy, it's sustainable. Um, it, had, it has lost one primary branch in the middle section right there, if you see it. But overall, the conditions are very good. Thank you. Seeing no one else in queue, I'd like to open this item up for public comment. If anyone does have comments, please uh, come up to the dais. Good evening, I'm Dean Bertella and I own the home at 980 Presidio. Um, my request to have the tree removed is not because it's not a beautiful tree, but because the roots of this tree have grown underneath my retaining wall, which you can see is cracked. The concrete patio that runs between the fence and the house has been lifted two inches, and my bedroom on the front corner, the foundation of that bedroom is now have a, a, a dip or a crack in it, a lift. So my issue is I have, I'm in thousands of dollars at this point to fix what I need to fix, but without removing the tree, I'm in the same position again. If I put a new retaining wall in and I fix the slab, I, I haven't solved my issue. So I, I'm requesting the tree to be removed because I cannot move forward. And if you could show the pictures that we provided, yeah, there is. That'd be a little more clear for you. There is a picture that we provided that showed that there are two, it's two inches from the, the patio on the other side, mm -hmm. concrete slab. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's significant. We do have that picture. I'm not sure if it's loaded for uh, no. the presentation, but thank you for that. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm just trying to get it solved so I can make the house look nicer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we appreciate you being here today. Um, being that I don't see anyone else uh, who wants to comment publicly, uh, I'd like to open up again for discussion. Um, anyone on the dais? I see one in queue here. Commissioner Fay. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. And I've, I've got tree raises at my house too, so I can relate. Um, and it's this hard thing. I feel like I'm not a tree expert. We've got a tree expert in front of us and I'm, I'm not a, you know, a soil expert, got some experience in that realm. But I guess probably um, to, our, to our arborist, I would love to just get a better understanding of how we evaluate, is this definitely the tree? It looks to me like from the evidence this is the tree, <laughs> and I and I know that there was some changes to the sidewalk prior, but I'm not an expert here. So, is this definitely the tree? Is this is this just our soil moving, or is this going to be a reoccurring problem if if this tree is not removed? It's a combination of both. It's it's soil. It's also the tree itself to a certain degree. If you look at the parkway, the parkway is somewhat small in length and width. So is, the, is there going to be a issue in the future? There might be. There's a strong possibility. Okay. Yeah, it's, 
It's such a hard one. I, you know, I emotionally struggle from with this on both sides as a homeowner, and I'm sure you do too, because it's a beautiful tree, and our neighborhood needs so many more trees. It's just it's heartbreaking to cut anything down, especially something that's probably been there for a really good amount of time and is a, a safe and beautiful tree. Um, but that's really difficult, you know, as a homeowner and as a as you know, looking after our public funds. If this is going to continue to be something that costs the city, I guess um, I guess for Arborus I ask as, as well, you know, what other options are there around this? If, you know, from, a, from an Arborist point of view, what are, what are the options that we're presented with? Well, certainly if the wooden fence and the wall gets removed, then the city can certainly on public property add root barrier panels to deflect the roots and sever the roots going that direction. I will certainly work with the property owner to get that completed. Okay. That's one option that is the most viable option for that tree to sustain the tree. Okay. Um, there is no other options prior to root pruning and adding root barrier panels. So that is the that's best option. Okay. So just to clarify, it's either root pruning and root barrier panels or leaving as is or tree removal. Exactly. And this tree cannot be replanted anywhere in our community. There's, would it be transplantable at all? No, not at all. Because of the requirements needed to remove the tree and the footprint of the tree itself, you'd be taking out the sidewalk and the fence itself. You would need at least 10 feet in each direction to remove the tree. So, and the cost of it is prohibitive. And so um, is that, is that the same case if the tree is removed to not be replanted? Is it the same process or is it a different process of tree removal? Do you still have to cut out that 10 feet no. or whatever it is? No, certainly through stump grinding, it would, the stump grinder itself, the machine itself, would they have smaller machines to work within that capacity area to remove the stump down to up to 12 inches. So the tree itself gets removed and then the stump gets removed down to 12 inches. So within that footprint right there, that can be accomplished. Okay. Okay, I think that's. Thank you. Commissioner DeSico. Uh, like Commissioner Faye said, I'm also conflicted with this because um, it is a healthy, viable tree. However, it's definitely affecting your private property. Um, and so I'm conflicted with it as well. Um, is your guys' intention to repair the damaged area on your private property side and you're trying to prevent further damage if you do repair that area? Is that more the concern? Yes. Clearly the retaining wall has to be replaced. Yes. And so uh, the concrete slab, I haven't really looked into what I can even, I think I'd have to rip everything out around the house to replace just that one piece. Um, but yes, I need to repair Obviously, the fence and the and the retaining wall are in disarray. They need to be right. done. It's a not doesn't look nice for the neighbors. I'm sure they don't appreciate it. Um, so I'm worried that if I do all that and the tree is still growing, I'm going to be back to square one. Uh, all of the, I mean, this has all happened. I've owned the house for 19 years. This wasn't happening when I bought the house. So in the last and. I'd say probably in the last 10 years, we've started to see the cracking and the movement. And now I'm in a, in a pickle because I've got to have it done. But yeah, I am concerned the tree will do it again or continue to cause the damage. And not just the retaining wall, when I now see my foundation of the, the bedroom that you can see in the first picture, that front bedroom and the idea that there is lifting on my foundation that's a whole different, for me, a financial level than a retaining wall. <laughs> so, and that concerns me. Definitely. Uh, and I think definitely we need to get these roots to stop growing. I think one way or another that needs to stop. So I think finding the best solution for that, definitely that's what we need to work towards. Um, I have a question for our arborist. If there was uh, a tree, if we removed the tree, would the roots continue to grow? Would the ground continue to settle based on the roots dying? What, it, what would that process if the tree was removed? The tree was removed, yes. The, the roots would still be trying to survive for at least six months to a year. So there would still be root activity. 
So would your recommendation, let's say the tree was removed, would your recommendation to the homeowner to be not to do any work for six months to a year until the root stopped uh, their movement? Yes. Okay. And I would work with the homeowner on that issue. Okay. And let's say we were able to go with the option of uh, <clears throat> replacing that retainer wall, like we said, and then you would have room to trim the roots and put in a root barrier to prevent any further growth in that area. Would that be the same time frame that those roots would need six months to a year before? Uh, no. So, so what happens if the retaining wall comes down and within the city's right away of 10 feet, we could put in the root barrier panels. I would probably go down 24 inches, which is two feet, which gives them an additional six inches. Certainly want to work with the property owner to make sure that that's going to be something that's going to be worthwhile and assist them and so there's no future damage. Okay. And it sounds like they're planning on re, uh, replacing this retaining wall. Obviously, we saw the damage on there. Uh, the city would be willing to work on that timeline that when the retaining wall is down that the city could come in and put in that root barrier at that time and then they could build the new wall on top of that immediately, or is there a time frame they need to wait? No, certainly if the retaining wall comes down, I'll certainly work with the property owner to get that root barrier panel installed immediately. And so there is no time frame. Basically, once that comes down, we install the root barrier panels down to 24 inches, and then once that gets completed, then they can do whatever they want to do after that. But I certainly want to work with them in their timelines and their time frames. Okay, great. and. Uh, again, just to reiterate, if that root barrier was put in and then they did the retaining wall, they would be able to immediately do the repair work on their private property, or would you suggest they wait the six months to a year? Well, I would. they can do it immediately because once the panels are installed, as far as deflection goes, those panels, those roots will not grow past that retaining wall anymore. Once they hit the panels, they stop, and they have to go down 24 inches to come back up. But the the remaining roots just die or would they continue to try to surface? The they, they just die because the other roots will basically try to regrow, which will in turn kill the roots that are trying, that were severed. So in other words, what's going to happen is that process from root barrier panel installation at 24 inches will definitely stop the, the roots from going towards that direction. The roots that are severed take a long time to get to a point where they grow on 24 inches down and come back up. So it's a matter of time. Now the older root, the, the roots that get severed, they do come back. If you took out the tree itself, then, then you have, you'd have six months or a year of growth. If you root barrier panel, then you, the roots themselves can grow back, but it takes quite a bit of time. So to salvage the tree, root barrier panels are the best option. Okay, I think that's all my questions about this at that time, at this time. Which way yeah. do the roots go if you put a root barrier? That means they're going towards the side, they're gonna, they're go gonna towards come towards the sidewalk? But not necessarily. Or so they'll I'll, come out so it's, a, it's a maybe? No, I'll, I'll certainly, there's, what's gonna happen is when you start removing root barrier panel, or the roots themselves, Yes, there will be some growth going in all three different directions. However, the basic premise of this is to try to preserve the tree. And so it's I, up to the commissioners to yeah. prove or deny. I understand that. I'm just trying to understand don't that. To I, I guess I don't understand the root barrier wall. That's not something in my realm, obviously. So, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll certainly work with you on that. Yeah. I'll, certainly, I'll certainly explain it to you. I'll yeah. certainly go through the process no. with you and, and certainly show you the root barrier panels prior to insulation what's going to occur, how it's going to happen, the timelines between there. Certainly want to do that to assist you. It's not, it's a non-issue. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, Commissioner has the floor. Cash. Yeah, thank you, Chair Erickson. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you, Deanne, for coming out tonight to talk about this. Um, I, I also want to disclose I'm conflicted as well. Um, I think that one of the most important roles we have up here on this commission 
is to be stewards of our public health infrastructure. So that's why it is, it is a really tough call when, you, when we have a healthy tree and we want to debate whether or not we're going to take away that piece of public health infrastructure. So I want to ask Jim a few more follow-up questions in addition to what Com Commissioner DeSico said, because I think this is really helpful for our understanding, for my understanding about this. Um, this retaining wall that could go in to prevent root growth onto um, the private property immediately, as opposed to waiting six to 12 months for the root growth to stop after the tree would be taken out, that retaining wall, would the city pay for that wall? No. Well, no. We, we, we would be paying for the root barrier panel installation down to 24 inches. Okay. Okay. Got you. I, I just, I think I am very much in favor of that compromise. Um, I think that's a compromise that would give freedom to the property owners to immediately have this addressed in a shorter time frame rather than waiting for root growth to stop if the tree is killed. I think it's a good compromise that protects the property and allows the solution to be solved. So that's what I'm leaning towards right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I don't see any other requests to speak. Oh, one more. <laughs> Would the property owners have a concern if the root barrier was installed? If the retaining wall came down, root barriers installed, and then you we would put you would put the w retaining wall back up and fix the damage that's been done. What would be your concern um, with that action? Uh, my concern is even with. I, I, again, I'm not sure how those barriers work, but these roots have obviously infiltrated quite a ways into my property and to be underneath the structure itself under the house under the house right. and so the idea that if they come in in a different location because that's quite a long wall and the house is on the other side of that quite a ways just the idea that if it, if it could occur again i mean I, it, it's a tree that the city owns that i am now going to have to fork out thousands and thousands of dollars to repair not just a wall, but a concrete patio and a slab. Hopefully and not. And that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that to me is a lot. And I don't want to have any risk of, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, I'm not selling the house, that it happens all again. Okay. And then I'm... I think we're even open, open to a, a smaller tree being put in. Something that isn't going to come underneath and destroy. As well. Okay, so uh, can I ask a couple other questions then uh, to our arborist? How long, if we put in a root barrier, what's the length of that root barrier? And if you know, what would be the anticipated length that the roots of this tree would go up underneath that retaining wall? Well, so if we chose to do this, and I'm willing to do this with this property owner, is we would go the entire length of retaining wall with the root barrier panels. As far as the root system themselves and regrowth, it all depends. There's a lot of things involved if there's a drought, as an example. If, in fact, uh, the turf parkway itself isn't watered correctly, that's another issue. If there's too much water, then roots are going to produce more. So there's certain different reasonings behind roots and their growth. It's difficult to determine exactly how much is going to occur, but certainly willing to help the property owner going the entire length of the retainer wall down to 24 inches. Um, certainly that's going to deter any further root growth going towards the house itself. Commissioner Fay. Yes, <laughs> this is a, yeah, it's a hard one. I guess, I, I know it's probably so hard to tell how long these things take to, to grow back, um, but do you have any estimate? Are we talking five years, 15, 25? Is, is it that far variability? It could be up to 10 years. Okay. I mean, it could be up to five years. It just depends on the tree itself and, and the watering practices and the growth of them. Liquid amber trees have aggressive root systems and they grow quickly. 
But this is an American sweet gum, right? Yeah, it's an okay. American sweet gum. It's, it's also called a liquid amber. Oh, okay. It's just, yeah, so the, there the, you go. the botanical <laughs> name is liquid amber cybrassiflua. Oh. Uh, but it's but people call it liquid amber. The, it's also called the American sweet gum. Gosh, I thought you swapped the trees on us. <laughs> I did. Um, um, okay. And then just one more question to the homeowners. Uh, personally, I've had very very similar thing happen to my house, and I was really concerned about it being the trees. I had these huge trees in front of my house. When I actually had an arborist come out to look at it, they determined it was not the trees, it was the soil. So I guess just a question, did you did did you have someone that was able to confirm the house stuff and was the trees by any chance? Well, when you, no. And, and, no. I don't know how you do that. No, but, because yeah. when, you, when you're looking yeah. at the retaining wall and you're looking it's at the concrete, concrete yeah. sides of the tree. And, right, and you right. look at the slab right behind the tree that's been raised two yeah. inches, yes. it's not, to me, it's not the soil. It's got, it has to have something to do with the tree where it's right around where that tree is. Right. The, the bedroom lifting, that's questionable. Yeah. But definitely that wall and that and the retaining that slab yeah. that slab. There's a ten by ten foot slab of concrete behind that wall that's lifted yeah. up two inches. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming out and and thank you for the education on the liquid amber. I have a quick question for the arborist. Um, can you comment on how many more years of growth this tree may have in it? Oh, up to 30, 40 years. I mean, okay. it's it's a small. It, this is a small tree for an American sweet gum. Okay. It is. So it's a potential. It can go to. It can grow to 60, 70 feet tall. So mm -hmm. how much bigger in diameter would you expect it to get? Uh, probably, I would say it's 15 right now. Maybe 25. At 25, would it probably be touching the the retaining wall above above grass level? It'd be close in proximity. The answer is yes. Thank you for that information. I have two more uh, requests in queue. Uh, my, my question is also for Arborist again. Um, is there any way of inspecting after five or ten years if the roots are in fact um, getting past that barrier one way or the other? Yes. What and would be the process to inspect after five uh, and or ten years? So what happens is the, you would see the root barrier panels start to move and shift because you see the t upper portion of them. And when it starts to shift a little bit, that means it's getting close. The roots are still pushing against them. At that point, there's various things we can do. We can actually root barrier panel again, which is a pretty common practice, which where you take the panels out and you saw blade them again and you sever the roots again in that direction. Um, is that something that's going to likely occur in 10 years, five years? Possibly. Would that require them to take down the retaining wall and fence that they just put in if they, let's say they put that in this year, would they need to take that down in order to do that? No, they would not. Okay. okay. Commissioner Ashendorf. Uh, yes, just a quick question to the arborist. The uh, estimated cost for the uh, the installation of the root barrier, do you have an idea on that? I, I would say it's going to be close to $1,000. Okay, thank you. That's including planting new trees too, correct? That is not including no. planting new trees. That is the root barrier installation yes. itself. Commissioner Rutherford? Yeah, just to follow up with that point, so if the barrier is put in, then no new replanting is needed because the barrier is being put in and it's saving the tree. Is that correct, Jen? That's correct. Got you. Um, does that mean that a barrier would be cheaper than replanting and removing the tree, or which one of those two is the cheaper options? The cheaper option would be to remove the tree because we have contract pricing and we get extremely good pricing. And to take the three to one replacement ratio and plant those trees elsewhere in the city. I would not plant a tree in that location. Gotcha. I mean, I guess I, I'm really conflicted again because in the past I have um, voted to support trees that are healthy. And so I think that's what I'm leaning to do again in this case, because I just think that if a tree is healthy, we should really do everything that we can to save and preserve the, the life of that piece of public health infrastructure. So I'm wondering that if the commission takes action tonight 
towards the compromise of a retaining wall being put in, can this action tonight be con have a contingency that at any point in the future, if there's another retaining wall that's needed, it can just go in or will that have to come back and require commission approval? To clarify, you mean uh, the root barrier? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Staff would definitely continue to work with the applicants in the future. We would continue to do what we need to do to preserve the tree. So it's root barrier panels, installations. If we need to trim the tree more frequently, we would do that as well. Certainly, we want to do what's right for the homeowner in the city of Costa Mesa. And we want to do what we need to do to try to resolve both issues and make sure that the homeowner is comfortable with what we're doing, number one. And number two, we preserve the tree. Gotcha. I mean, that seems like a solid compromise in this case, that if we could take an action tonight and that at any point in the future, if the roots become a problem again, that the wall, that the city would come in, cut the roots again, put another wall back in so that it prevents any further damage to the property. Uh, another root barrier panel, not the wall. Sorry, panel. Not, That's okay. Not I'm confusing the words. That's okay. I'm so talking about the same thing. I, I, I would make, I'll make a commitment right now that whatever we need to do, as far as additional root barrier panels, root pruning, whatever we need to do, we'll certainly do it as a city. Got you. I mean, I certainly appreciate that commitment from the city and from our arborist, um, just because that would allow the tree to be saved, the strong, healthy tree to be preserved, and then it would give some peace of mind to the homeowners knowing that the city is gonna do whatever's necessary with regards to a retainer wall to keep the roots from damaging your property. But that's not that that's the part that is not there. The retaining wall is still going to be my responsibility. And this tree gets 20, 25 years older and grows. It's going to be hitting the wall again. Mm -hmm. And I can't move that wall. My backyard is not on street level at all. My backyard is actually raised. So that retaining wall is what's holding in my whole backyard. Two feet of dirt. Mm -hmm. So that tree is going to grow and again because how close it is is going to have hit the retaining wall and i'm going to have to replace it. it it's inevitable he, he said that the diameter is going to grow 50, and, 10 and, more inches and it, it's inevitable it will eventually hit the retaining wall at some point and so i will so, be back I mean, to replace to take the it retaining out and wall. put three smaller trees in i, I think that's a great compromise mm -hmm. But I mean, it, for us to go and put $10,000 in concrete work and a new fence and just hope, you know, right. assess it in 10 years is, is not a long-term option. And the tree's still growing. It's not like with the tree's not growing. Mm -hmm. You're stopping the roots from going underneath, but you're not stopping the growth of the tree. Appreciate the concerns, definitely. Um, I'd like to see at this time if there's a motion anywhere on the dais. Uh, I have one request. Sorry, I had one more question. Just to clarify, <laughs> it's such a personal thing, you know. Uh, just to clarify, you said you would not plant, if we do the three to one ratio of planting three more trees, you would not plant in that location. Is there a reason why? I just don't feel that a tree would be, in a, be able to grow in that footprint extremely well. I mean, in other words, if you put a new tree in there, you got, a, you got a retaining wall, you have a wooden fence, you need, the sun needs to be there. There's various factors for a young tree to grow in that location. Um, certainly, if you, if you did the three to one replacement ratio, those trees would be planted like in a park system where there's full sunlight. So the, there's options. Um, I would not because also, if you look at the parkway itself, see how small it is, the footprint isn't very good for other trees to be planted in that area. Three would not fit in there. Would one fit? One would fit in there. And <laughs> we could, a crepe myrtle would fit in there, a purple leaf plum tree would fit in there. Okay. I mean, there's, there's smaller trees that can be planted there mm -hmm. um, as an option. It's just that, you know, when you have that wooden fence up that high and you have a small planted tree that's five feet tall, then it becomes a little problematic for growth. However, if, if the city itself came in and used the watering truck as an example and watered um, supplemental irrigation for that newly planted tree, that could help, absolutely. Could we use 
um, different products to assist the tree in growth? The answer is yes as well. Okay. Let's see one more request. So that's not independently watered by the city. That's no. is that the homeowner's irrigation that waters that? Yes. Okay. There is a sprinkler system. There's a sprinkler system. It's a, there's a dedicated sprinkler system for that area. Okay. And uh, what is the distance? I, I saw uh, the tape measure of the two inch rays uh, in your guys's backyard. What is the? Do we know the distance between the fence and the tree currently? What is that space? I didn't measure it. It's, it's no more than three feet. Okay. Oh, I don't think and we're anticipating the from, uh, from the sidewalk to the retain. To no, the no, retaining no. Wall? He's talking about the tree. From the, the tree to the tree fence to the retaining itself. Wall. Oh, it's. It's a little less than a foot. Yeah. It's 14 and a half six, inches. Six, eight inches. Oh. 14 and a half inches. 14 and a half. Okay. I'm surprised. Thank you. From the tree to the wall. And then what would be the anticipated time that the projecting the tree's growth that it would uh, run up to the fence um, at 14 and a half inches? So depending, depending on the, if we have no more droughts, if the tree is watered correctly, um, certainly that tree could grow that way within the next 10 years. I mean, that's, it, there's a strong possibility mm -hmm. because that 50, the diameter of the trunk itself is at 15 inches right now. There's a strong possibility that within 10 to 15 years, you're hitting that 25 mark. Okay. And at that point, let's say the tree, let's say we do the root barrier, uh, they re replace the damage on their side of the property, they put up the retaining wall and they put up a new fence, and let's say 10 years it does hit that fence. Um, what would be your suggestion at that point with the tree? There would be no suggestion because there would be no room to do anything. In other words, if the base of the tree itself grew another 10 to 15 inches, there's no room to add additional root barrier panels, unfortunately, because the retaining wall is there. So when you have the base of the tree and you have the retaining wall itself, there's, we would, within 10 to 15 years, have a conflict. And what would be the resolution of that conflict? Is it leave the tree, take out the tree? I mean, when that does occur in Costa Mesa, what typically is our policy? Uh, typically, if, if it gets to a point where there's no mitigation and we can't do anything, unfortunately, we have to remove the tree in certain cases. It just it's case by case. So if this tree is going to grow to that girth anticipated in 10 years, then you're saying the action after 10 years is tree removal? There's a strong possibility of tree removal, yes. At that because time, you, can't also shave, you can't shave the backside of that tree. You, you don't want to do that because you open wounds and then you get disease and pest in there and becomes problematic and the potential of topping or right. toppling of the tree is high. Yeah, which is a safety concern. And also at that size, it could pose a uh, uh, infrastructure possibilities. As you can see, the sidewalk was replaced due to minor lifts in the past. Uh, at 25 inches in that space, it would become a issue on the sidewalk side as well as the wall side. We would monitor that. I mean, street side, we look, we look at the street to see if it's rippling the street. We look at the sidewalk itself. We'd have to determine where there's a point in time where unfortunately a tree has to be removed. Because I thought the root barrier is a great compromise but now my concern is if that's done in 10 years anticipated this tree is going to come out anyways yeah so what you're doing is trying to preserve the tree at this moment so you know if it's 10 years from now that we have to look at the tree and review the tree in 10 years what you just did is you just preserved the life of that tree for 10 years so if, in fact, if you want to, as commissioners, if you want to remove that tree, it is your right to remove that tree. But it's entirely up to you how you want to do that. Just looking at it right now, the best remedy right now, if you want to preserve the tree, is to add the root barrier panels. Down the road, we need to make another decision 10 years or 15 years down the line. And there's nothing else at that point we would be able to do to preserve that tree, to 
prevent it from knocking over their fence? The, at that point, the answer is no. We would, we would try to resolve the issue and the conflict with the retaining wall to the best of our abilities. However, when it gets to that girth and that size of 25 inches, there's not a lot you can do. Okay. With it because of the small footprint of the width of the turf parkway. And then one last question. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this, but the actual property line versus where the fence is put, have we, has anyone investigated? I know sometimes fences get put near a property line. Have we investigated where the actual property line is? The city's right away is 10 feet. The answer is no, we have not. But if you, I measured from top of curb to middle of tree, it was seven feet, two inches. If you add the 14 inches from the block wall to the center of the tree itself, you're, you're not hitting that 10 foot right of way. So in other words, it's that probably that fence is not on the 10 foot line. Who would we need to talk to to investigate if that fence is actually built on the property line or if it's further than the property line? I would certainly work with the engineering division. Um, I would contact them and I would ask them to review that for us as a city. Because that kind of changes my opinion about what I would do tonight. If that fence should be moved back some distance, um, then I think a root bearer makes sense. If that fence actually is sitting on the property line, then doing a root barrier and then needing to remove this tree in 10 years anyways doesn't make as much sense to me. Well, if we're, if we're, if we're at seven, seven feet, two inches, and we add 14 inches to that, we're like eight feet, five inches. So there's a foot and a half somewhere. There's a difference. However, I want to make sure that because the information that was provided to me was from engineering. So I think that engineers, we should contact the engineering division and we should have them make sure that it's 10 feet right away and make sure that, you know, where that retaining wall and fence is. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most prudent move at this moment. Okay, commissioners, I'm, I'm ready to entertain a motion if anyone has one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to make a motion based on what Jim just said about investigating the retaining wall of having the engineers investigate that and then look at this again next month if that's possible to make a motion for that. Do I have a second? Um, Director Aguilar, is, yeah, it, is it possible? I believe the commission has to make a um, decision tonight. They can, um, a possibility would be to direct the uh, applicant to work with the G staff um, to investigate that um, and also look at the alternatives that were mentioned during um, the review today, tonight. Okay. So does the motion, as it's said, create an action? It would essentially be to direct the applicant to work with the city um, to preserve the tree if that is the direction of the commission. I'm not sure that's the motion that the commissioner made. Do you want to clarify? Yeah, sorry if that was unclear. I, I was wondering just based on the comments of the arborist, if we could direct city staff and the applicant to work with the city engineers and figure out what the specific right of way is with the wall that exists right now and then see if there's any variance in the alternatives that results from that. Well, before we uh, agendize the item, and, and ask for it to come back next month. You can definitely ask that city staff work with the applicant and we work with the engineering division to get the exact right of way, the measure of the wall, and confirm the exact location of the property line versus the wall and the distances between the wall and the tree. And then we'll get back to you with that information. And at that time, uh, it, a report could be drafted and then we could look into agendizing the item once we have all the information. Thank you, Bruce. That said much better than I could say it. <laughs> um, but. Could that be the motion that I make? I'll defer to staff to make sure that's an adequate motion. If, if the motion is essentially to continue and, and to ask staff to investigate further the property line, um, is that the verbiage we should use? Yes, that would be correct. And we'd work with the applicant to, to make sure that they are also in agreement of this at this time. Okay. And they'll work with city staff. And it will get back to you with information. It will not actually be an agendized item until we have all the facts. Correct. Okay. 
Um, so do I have a completed motion, staff? <laughs> yes. How's, okay. it, how's it look on it? Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. I, I'll second that motion. Okay. We're supposed to use our buttons, so. Um, I, I press motion closed, I suppose. Call for, Call for the question. The motion carries 5-0. Okay. Thank you, staff, and we appreciate your willingness to work with the homeowner and determine exactly where this wall, this uh, root barrier could be placed and, and the validity of uh, the situation as a whole. We look forward to seeing you soon again so we can discuss this with a... If, it, if it's declared the wall's in the right spot, then we'll reassess. Precisely. If the wall's moved over into the city too much, it's our job to move it back away from the tree? Is that, is that what we're kind of getting at? I'm not certain, but that's probably part of, that's part of the process, is understand where, where the actual property line is. Outside of our purview, though, isn't it? Yeah. Correct. That is not a, that is not a decision that is to be made here. That would be uh, working through the engineering division, the homeowner, and if such a thing occurred, it would have to go through the attorney's office, city attorney's office. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 11, Parks and Community Services, Director's Report. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Chair Erickson, members of the commission. The city summer session of recreation and community services activities and programs is now wrapping up in its final week with more than 260 classes and dozens of additional program and event offerings for participants of all ages. The Summer Rocks program, which is held daily at the DRC, Bolero Community Center, and at Sonora Elementary School, has more than 700 um, active participants registered, which is ending this week. All summer youth programs are winding down as well, including Camp Costa Mesa, Camp Mini Explorers, and Aqua Camp, all programs which fill to capacity. The sports, music, and arts camp, known as Smart Camp, came to a close earlier at the end of the month in July, um, both at Ray Elementary and the Costa Mesa Middle School. This partnership camp with the N uh, Newport Mesa Unified School District introduced participants to varying sports, musical, and artistic mediums so that they, the children would be exposed to prior, exposed prior to middle and high school where these type of programs are offered as part of the curriculum. The camp had more than 500 registered participants, was free of charge, and ended with concerts by the band participants as well as a choir. The summer teen camp, which operates out of Two Winkle Middle School, was full each week this summer and is now in its final week. The mobile recreation program uh, served more than 1,000 youth last month by bringing play, homework help, and mentorship to several neighborhoods throughout the city. The program continues to visit Shalmar Park, T. Winkle Park, Lions Park, and the Fillmore area neighborhood. The program also continues to be utilized for community events such as Movies in the Park, the 3rd of July event at the OC Fairgrounds, and other events that take place on the new Lions Park event lawn area. Animal Care Services staff, along with our animal shelter and adoption service provider, saw more than 100 animals enter and exit our city animal care system during the past month, with 37 of those animals being adopted and 24 others being directly reunited with their owners. The city animal shelter participated in the Clear the Shelter event this past weekend, where nearly 80 animals were adopted. The Senior Center remains busy with a robust schedule of classes, presentations, seminars, and social and wellness programs for its total membership of more than 2,500 members. Last month's special event was the Intergenerational Spelling Bee, which had participation in the age range of 10 years old to 91 years old. The final six competitors, which included one 10-year-old and one 12-year-old, as well as four seniors, enjoyed their time at the event. The summer months are a busy time for the Community Services Department, and events are coordinated by the Parks and Community Services Department. Staff have been hard at work providing programs and event at the new lawn of the new lawn at Lions Park, and these have recently included Costa Mesa's third Saturday Art Walk, the Living Living Up in the Lawn series, lawn games, literature programs, crafts in the park, disc golf, and much more. Earlier this week, the staff hosted a special Dog Days of Summer event, which included games, hot dogs, and ice cream for both humans and dogs. For a full schedule of Lions Park event lawns, the public can visit the city's website and search for Lions Park event lawn schedule. The Chargers training camp came to an end this month with thousands of fans visiting the Jack Hammett Sports Complex to cheer on the players and watch practice. 
A total of 13 training dates were open to the public with the final two days including a joint practice with the Saints. As we head into the fall season, we would like to remind everyone about the signature juried art show event, Art Venture, which takes place September 6th and 7th at Seegerstrom. Additionally, the fish fry will return for its 72nd year on September 20, the 20th through the 22nd at Fairview Park. And finally, I'd like to thank the commission for their patience as we continue to transition our team. Our very own department head, Justin Martin, has been serving in the capacity of acting assistant city manager for the past several weeks, allowing me the opportunity to serve in the acting parks and community services director role. As the city begins our search for an assistant city manager, we'll be sure to continue to update the commission. And with that, I conclude my report and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, acting director Aguilar. Are there any questions or comments from the commissioners? Okay, seeing none, well, I'd like to uh, conclude the meeting at 8.10 p.m. Thank you all for attending and we'll see you in September.